Good evening and welcome. My name is Susan Stabile. I'm the director of the Office for Spirituality. And we're delighted to have you here this evening for our program, Prosecuting Jesus. Uh, this program is co-sponsored uh, by our office, the Office of Spirituality, the Office for Mission, the Department of Theology, and the Department of Catholic Studies. And I'm absolutely delighted to get to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Mark Osler, the Robert and Marion Short Distinguished Chair in Law at our law school. Um, Mark started his career as a federal prosecutor. Uh, he then taught for a number of years at Baylor Law School until we were fortunate enough to steal him away uh, to bring him here to St. Thomas. He's a wonderful teacher, a wonderful colleague, and does an enormous amount of good work in the area of criminal law, particularly in sentencing and in clemency, in trying to get the policies of our country to reflect the dignity of the human person. Uh, and he's here tonight to talk about his book, Prosecuting Jesus. And I think that's enough for me to say about you, except to say that I am very privileged to call Mark my dear friend. So I give you Mark Thank Osler. You. Thank you so much. So I have never been in this room before and uh, got an awesome view of the football team practicing, which reminds, what's that? Up there, okay, all right. Uh, I'll go where they want me. So, but it's a, it's a very Texasy kind of thing to have the room looking over the football field. And in, in 2001, uh, my family and I were living in Waco, Texas, which is where Baylor's located. How many people here have ever been to Waco, Texas? A couple. That's good. That's above average for Minneapolis. And <clears throat> That day, two things happened that in juxtaposition with one another changed the way I look at things. And what happened was this. I woke up that morning and I opened up the newspaper, the Waco Tribune Herald. And uh, on the front page of the Waco Tribune Herald was a story about an execution. Now this was not unusual for a paper in Texas in 2001 especially. There were quite a few executions. And it had, at the start of the article in the lead, something that often you'll find in stories about executions. And it's what the person chose for their last meal. It's kind of a strange obsession, really, that, that we care what people had for their last meal. But people really did. When I started researching this, one of the things I found was three different coffee table books about last meals that showed a picture of the last meal and, and the person who was condemned. And, uh, you know, it talked about the, the crime that this person had been convicted of. But what really caught my attention was that description of the cheeseburger and the Dr. Pepper and the cupcake, whatever it is he had, he had chosen for his last meal. Uh, a couple years before that, when a woman named Carla Faye Tucker was executed in Texas in 1998, uh, there was such interest in that case that the website for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice crashed from people trying to figure out what her last meal was. Um, so anyways, read this, went off to church. And we went to a, a Baptist church in Waco, Seventh and James Baptist Church. And it happened that that was the week, or you know, the week of the month when uh, we took communion in that church. And so, you know, the, <coughs> in a, a church like that, in church, instead of going to the front, usually it's passed between the rows. And so it's passed me. I take the host and I put it in my hand and I realize that this is the last meal of a man condemned to die. This is the cheeseburger and the cupcake and the Dr. Pepper. And there was something deeply challenging about that. Um, you know, Jesus did know that he was going to be executed told people that. He didn't know that that was the last meal he was going to have. Um, and, and we attach such importance to that. Uh, and, and it stuck with me for days. It was, it was hard to, to put out of my mind 
that combination of things. That, that with that person who had committed this horrible crime, and even though some people on death row turn out to be innocent, most of them are guilty, and they're guilty of horrible crimes. They do things that we could never imagine doing. None of you here think that you're capable of going to a gas station, robbing the gas station, and then shooting the attendant, or killing a police officer, or, or killing a baby. Some of the things that people on death row did. We don't have a point of connection naturally with those people, especially when they're defined by that event, that thing that they did. But the food we understand. We know well, that's why I think we're drawn to the cheeseburger, to the cupcake, to the Dr. Pepper, is because that's a point of connection. And so is the host that we, we hold in our hand. There's something about food that's at that elemental level. Um, I was against the death penalty. I've been against the death penalty for a long time. I was against the death penalty when I was a prosecutor. I wasn't qualified to do death penalty cases. Um, but. I realized that there was an opportunity there uh, to talk about this, to, <clears throat> to combine those things, to challenge the death penalty in Texas by talking about Christianity, R putting together for people in church the combination of facts that there was a deep belief in the morality of the death penalty in Texas, and at the same time, it's a very Christianized political culture. If any of you have ever lived in Texas, if, if someone is running for sheriff, for example, uh, the ads will show a couple things. Number one, riding a horse while wearing a cowboy hat, uh, being surrounded by children, even if they don't have children, they somehow manufacture this shot, and then uh, walking out of church. Um, you know, if you don't have those three things in your ad, you're not going to have credibility, it seems. Um, and so what I wanted to do was find a way to combine those two things, to, to mash up uh, the politicized faith with the fact that at the center of it, that, that included the death penalty, at the center of that faith was an unjust execution. Um, now, a couple things that I want to make clear about advocacy. That's a lot of what I teach. And um, the thing about advocacy and being a trial lawyer, and I was a prosecutor for five years, I've uh, <clears throat> was trained in that, and since then I've trained other people in how to do trial work. And often the mistake that people make when they, when they think about trial work and what lawyers do is it's about argument. That, uh, you know, what you see Sam Waterston do in court, uh, in law and order, is what lawyers do. You know, they have the three minute closing argument and then the jurors start to cry and then they come back with a verdict. The truth is that, and this is something lawyers know, is that very rarely do you argue someone into a position. Rather, what you do is story them into it. It's narrative that's important. It's what people experience, what they live through, what they hear, that is constructed as a story that they can connect with, where there is that point of connection that's going to change their mind. And that's true outside of court as well. Think about your own lives, something that you've changed your mind about, that probably very few of you changed your mind because you were driving along and you pulled up behind a bumper sticker and you read it and you thought, ah, oh, that's right, I've been wrong all these years. Unlikely. Uh, probably you haven't changed your mind because you went to Thanksgiving dinner and your aunt was railing on about politics and you thought, gosh, she's right. When we change our mind, it's usually because what we believe is, first of all, troubled by a story. And that troubling moves us to examine what we have believed. And then sometimes to change our mind. Uh, <clears throat> and so if you want to change minds, you have to either tell people a good story or allow them to experience something that's going to lead them to a different way of seeing things. Uh, now, I, I, I tried argument first. I wrote a book about the death penalty and, and Jesus just in juxtaposition, looking at the, the trial of Jesus as a death penalty process. Um, but, you know, that really was an argument. I wanted a better way to do it. In, 
fast forwarding, in, in 2010, uh, my family and I moved here. And when we got here, shortly thereafter, um, I was asked to speak at a death penalty conference. And so I go to this death penalty conference, and uh, it's, a, it's called People of Faith Against the Death Penalty. And it was rooms like this, uh, a bunch of people had been asked to come and give a talk, and so I go and I give my talk. And people thought it was great. And then the next guy got up and he gave a talk, and we all thought he was great. And then the person got up after them, and we agree with that person too. But it's because we all went in there agreeing with each other. We were all against the death penalty. It was in the title of the conference that you registered for, People of Faith Against the Death Penalty. And I realized that while it was affirming to do something like that, it was pretty lousy advocacy. None of us were changing anybody's mind because we had an audience of all people who agreed with us in the first place. And in, in America right now, there's a lot of that kind of advocacy. Um, and so I started to think, okay, how can I break out of that? How can I move beyond talking to people who agree with me? Um, I didn't want to. I didn't want to book things, <laughs> or push for things like, like that conference anymore. And so I thought back to that moment in Texas, and an experiment that I tried back there in that church, which was doing the trial of Jesus in front of uh, people who were for the death penalty, or uh, hadn't made up their mind yet. And to do that, I had to get into groups of conservative people in death penalty states. And the best place to find those people is in church. So develop this trial of Jesus. And the trial, a, a capital trial is divided up into two parts. The first part is when they determine whether the person is, uh, is guilty or not guilty. The second part is when they determine the sentence, whether the person's going to be executed or not. And so for the trial, what we did was uh, only do the second part. So we do the sentencing phase, which involves an opening statement, uh, testimony coming in. We drew all the testimony from the Gospels themselves, and then a closing argument to the jury. And then we divided up the audience um, into groups of 12 and had them deliberate to a verdict. Uh, and then we'd take the verdicts. There was never an explicit argument against the death penalty. Uh, our purpose was to put those two things in juxtaposition and trouble people so that hopefully they'd continue that journey on their own. We did this in 11 different states. I think we've done it 17 times. Um, and we got in front of audiences that were for the death penalty. We did it twice in Texas, once in a big church in Oklahoma City. We did it at Regent University, which is Pat Robertson's school in Virginia Beach, Virginia, which is a big death penalty state. Uh, we did it at Fuller Seminary in California, which is reconsidering the death penalty in this election, um, and, and several other places. Uh, and it was, a, it was a fascinating experience. Now, I didn't do this by myself. I had a lot of collaborators. and. Um, they were people who had skills that in some way were different or better than mine. That's one thing I found about collaboration is that, and I found this with, <coughs> with Professor Stabile, who's one of my collaborators, is that I always look for collaborators who are better at something than I am because that way it's gonna pull me up. Um, and my collaborators for this, I drew on two of my former students and one of them, Joy Tall from Baylor, Another one, Sarah Somerville, was a student here at St. Thomas. Uh, and then I got Jesus a public defender since he was indigent. Um, I found a, a public defender from Chicago named Gene Bishop, who was especially valuable because the same way it's a little counterintuitive to some people that for me as a prosecutor, I was against the death penalty. She was against the death penalty um, despite or perhaps because of the fact that her sister, her brother-in-law, and their unborn child were all killed uh, by a 16-year-old in 1990. And so she was a surviving family member of murder. 
that came to matter later. Uh, one of the most memorable things in the process of, of doing this, this event happened in Nashville, Tennessee. And we presented the, the trial at Carson Newman, which is a Southern Baptist school in Jefferson City, Tennessee, and gave a presentation in Nashville at Belmont College. And first we talked to the undergrads, and Belmont had just started a law school. And they didn't even, they, they've built a building for it now, but at the time it was, it was in an old maintenance shed. And so they were kind of jammed into the little offices and cubby holes from the maintenance department. And uh, we were walking out after giving our talk and noticed one of the professors there was Alberto Gonzalez. Now, Alberto Gonzalez was uh, attorney general under George Bush. He was very much for the death penalty. He'd been the counsel to Governor Bush when he was in Texas as well. Um, I worked for a long time on the 100 to 1 ratio between crack and powder in the federal sentencing guidelines. And it was Alberto Gonzalez's name that was often on the opposing briefs as the attorney general um, defending that law. So kind of wanted to talk to Alberto Gonzalez. Uh, and we were with uh, the chaplain from from Belmont, a guy named Todd Lake, who we had known in Waco. And uh, we knock on the door, door opens, and there he is, Alberto Gonzalez, in this little windowless office made out of a broom closet or something. Uh, and we went in and introduced ourselves, and I said, you know, we were just giving a, a presentation on the death penalty to your students. And he said, don't tell me. You're against the death penalty. And I said, yeah, we, we're against the death penalty. And he said, you know, people like you, you wouldn't be against the death penalty if it was your sister or your brother or your kid. And I thought, I'm not going to field this one. And then Jean Bishop took that question. And she was so gracious about it. What she said was, uh, I know a lot of people who feel that way. A lot of people who did lose a family member who feel the way that you do. But I don't. And let me tell you why. My sister was murdered. And my brother-in-law, my sister was pregnant with what would have been my parents' first grandchild. And, you know, we've all done this where we say something <laughs> where we've really stepped in it. And I think Alberto Gonzalez realized that he deeply stepped in it at that point. Um, and his, his attitude changed. He became much more open-minded and, and wanted to talk to us and engaging. And it was a fascinating discussion. And eventually, one of the things that came up was Carla Faye Tucker. Now, you remember I mentioned her before, that the website crashed when she was executed in Texas. One of the things that was, that was interesting about her case is that there was no questions of innocence. She was guilty. She admitted guilt. It was a heinous, I think it was a double murder with an ax. Uh, she was high on meth. She and her boyfriend were stealing motorcycle parts from another guy. And, and uh, they, they ax murdered that guy and I think one other individual. So brutal murder, definitely qualified for the death penalty uh, in Texas and, and no question of innocence. But while she was in prison, she changed over uh, to become a model prisoner. She got off drugs. She converted to Christianity. She became a leader within the women's prison at Gatesville, which is not far from Waco, um, and was relatively beloved within that community. When she was due to be executed, the people who intervened for her included uh, Pope John Paul II and Pat Robertson and a lot of other religious leaders um, George Bush was the governor at that time. Alberto Gonzalez was his, um, his counsel. And so we asked about this. <laughs> you know, what, what happened with Carla Faye Tucker? And he told the story. He said, you know, that, that was a strange one because, you know, we had time allotted to talk about it a couple days before the execution was to take place because that's when we considered whether or not we'd commute the sentence to life. Um, something that Bush did not do, except in a, a few cases. And he said, the governor turned to me and said, do you believe it? Do you think she has really converted to Christianity? Or is she just faking it, trying to get out of the death penalty? 
and Gonzalez told us, he said, I don't know. You know, I've never met her. I, I don't know if she's, that's true or not. So Bush said, I want you to go find out. Drive up to Gatesville and talk to Carla Faye Tucker. And so he does. Gets in his car, drives an hour and 15 minutes, goes to see Carla Faye Tucker. Sits down with her for an hour. And they talk about it. Gets back in his car, drives to Austin, finds Governor Bush again. And Bush says, so what'd you think? And Alberto Gonzalez told us, he said, I believe her. I think it's true. And that's where the story ended. <laughs> um, and of course, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> but she was executed. And Gonzalez said something I'll never forget, which is, yeah, Governor Bush thought that if she really had converted, she was going to be okay anyways. When people pretend that faith doesn't impact our secular world, I remind them of that, that none of us are fully secular people, that we bring our values that carry over from faith, a lack of faith, our challenges of faith, into the way we view other things. Um, and if we, if we pretend that's not a part of it, we're probably not being honest. There were some remarkable moments that happened when we were doing the trial in various points. And I want to read just a brief part of the book that's about one of them. Um, we took a long break from doing the trial, about eight months off. And during that period, uh, kind of had to you know, get the mojo back. So we decided we'd do it back here in Minneapolis on the law school campus. And uh, so we got everybody up here, lined up our witnesses, and uh, got everything together. Um, and this is about doing the trial that time. Hank Shea is one of my colleagues who is also a former prosecutor who served as the judge. So the assembled students hushed as Hank Shea approached the microphone and introduced the case. Like Susan Stabile, Hank represents a particular and important part of the Catholic laity who seek to comport their work with their faith. He speaks gently, but with purpose, and with the authority that comes from that rare combination of humility and strength. As he spoke, I looked past Joy to our opposing counsel. Jean and Sarah were wearing nearly identical dark suits, and they furtively conferred, their long dark hair forming an opaque curtain. Joy rolled her eyes and whispered, posers. The break was good for us, the, the eight months we'd taken off, and there was a renewed energy. Joy gave our opening, did the direct examination of the rich young ruler, and cross-examined the centurion. I'd probably break in here and, and explain something, which is that when we did the trial, it wasn't scripted. I'm a trial lawyer, I'm not an actor. So uh, we didn't tell the other side who we were gonna call as a witness necessarily, or what the arguments were going to be. Just like in trial, we had to react to what the other side did. Um, and so that's what was playing out here. Uh, I was to examine Peter and cross-examine a new character that the other side was going to call, the woman from John 8, before offering our closing argument. From the beginning, I sensed that the core of this one would be the new witness, and my hunch was correct. After Jean announced her as the next witness, Susan Stabile, wearing a long black skirt and a purple blouse, stood and walked tentatively to the witness stand. As she was sworn in, there was a trace of palpable fear in her. The fear wasn't Susan. Uh, she's a tough-as-nails New York lawyer, but rather the woman she'd become for this testimony. As she took her seat, she looked down at the ground rather than up at the proceeding. Empathy is a core Ignatian value. It was clearly expressed from the moment that Jean Bishop had turned to Judge Shea and announced her next witness. One of Jean's gifts, born of years in the courtroom, is that she's a master of tone. She can signal a witness simply through the warmth in her voice or the lack of it. It's a subtle art, one that you have to watch for carefully. But I saw a master at work as Jean began questioning Susan. She started with a few kind questions on the witness's background and her living situation. Then she moved to the essence. Ma'am, I know this might be hard for you to talk about, but have you been in trouble recently? Susan continued to look down. Yes, I was to be killed by the authorities, she whispered. Jean forged ahead. What was it that you did? 
I was lying with a man. He was not my husband. Susan's voice was one of a person trying to be strong. They took me to be stoned. What happened then? Jean asked. It was at that moment, right then, that everything changed. Instead of describing the events in the Bible from the omniscient perspective of the gospel writer, Susan told them it was the scorned woman. From the literal perspective of a woman about to be killed who was thrown to the ground and her face pressed to the dust. Stirring in her seat, she talked about being face down in the dirt and then turning to see someone. What happened then, Jean asked again. Susan continued to stir and we were all transfixed. I heard the stones fall to the ground one by one. She wasn't describing the men because from her perspective on the dirt, that's not what she would have seen. Rather, she describes something that will never leave me, the sound of stones, one by one, falling into the dust harmlessly by the feet of the men who had come to kill her. Who did you see? Jean asked. It was then, for the first time, that Susan's head came up. Him, she exclaimed, voice full of awe, pointing at the defendant. There was a gasp and then a shocked silence in the audience. It was like light flooding a cave. Jesus was there among us. The student playing Jesus... Derek froze in place as people followed Susan's eyes to him. What was supposed to happen next was that I would rise and cross-examine the witness, poking holes in the story. Honestly, I can't remember if I did or not, and it really doesn't matter. We gave our closings, and a blaze of sun came through the windows, and as we finished, I looked over at them all, David and Sarah, Jean and Hank and Phil, the new students in front of us. There was a calm of revelation over it all. It was... You remember that moment, I'm sure. It was, it was a remarkable thing. Um, and it was one of those times when I was supposed to be up there being the lawyer, but what I was doing was really looking out at the students and at the people in the audience. And it was like they were actually looking at Jesus, that there was this, because Professor Stabile had provided us a perspective of humility, of ultimate humility, we were able to look up and, and see that. And that was, that was really a remarkable thing. Um, I, uh, one of the things about writing this book that I was really recalling was that doing this trial was something that lasted for about three years. And the people who were involved in it, who did it, we all changed during that time. And we all spun out of it into doing different things. Um, Jean really embraced the, the forgiveness and the idea of forgiveness for the person who had killed her sister. And it was during that time, and especially at the end of it, that she went to visit him in prison and began to do that. And she wrote a book called Change of Heart that's pretty remarkable about that experience. What happened to me was that I think it was such a dark place to be. I mean, I, I am a Christian. I believe. And to time after time make an argument against Jesus was wearying. But it did something else, too. And it's that it let me see probably for the first time, and this is someone who spent a career in criminal law, to see what one of Jesus' imperatives really looks like, which is when you visit those in prison, you visit me. That's really a hard thing to grapple with, especially if you've been a prosecutor. What does that mean, that when you visit those in prison, you visit him? How can we see, I mean, remember I started out talking about how the convicted murderers are so different than us that we can't imagine being that person. And Christ, on the other hand, is, is we can't imagine being perfection either. And yet here, Christ is comparing himself to the prisoner. Um, I had started a clinic uh, to help people get clemency. I'd worked on the crack laws for a long time. They changed the law, but they didn't make it retroactive, which means that there were a lot of people who were in prison for really long times who didn't get the benefit of that change in the law. 
And so I started working on clemency petitions so that they would have shorter sentences. And I got to work with my students on this. One of those students, David Best, is here tonight. He worked on cases. And uh, what that meant was that I got a lot of mail. And I got a lot of brown envelopes. Uh, I've used this one before, but it has particular meaning to me. This is, this is a typical envelope that I'd get. And if I was gone for a couple weeks at the end of the summer, I'd come back and there'd be 10 or 15 of these waiting for me. And, it, and I hated opening my mail because most of the time I had to say, no, I can't help you. Um, and there was always a story in there. And once I started seeing a Christian imperative that's seeing those stories, it became even harder. This particular one is from a man named Ronald Blunt. Uh, it's from Louisiana. And I opened it up. And, you know, he, he put, they always put way too much postage on. Uh, you know, he put 10 stamps on this. It really only needs two. I don't know if this was ironic or not, but he used stamps that say justice, equality, liberty, and freedom, um, which is a little ironic coming from the penitentiary. But he sent me two things, and one of them is the transcript of his sentencing. Uh, he was serving a life term for narcotics trafficking. Um, and so I opened it, and I think I opened it, and it was like, you know, curtilage. I opened it at random. And what I got to was this. He was being asked what his role was in narcotics. And he said, when they said that I was doing anything, it was nothing more than to get me a piece of rock. And that was probably what they said I, they said I took them to different locations. But that's not taking them to my brother. I had nothing to do with anything to do with a conspiracy judge. I don't know what that means. I mean, they said... I took them to this place over there to obtain, and the court says, where they got crack. And then he said, they got it from the village where I hang at. I hang in a store begging for nickels and quarters and dimes. I stayed on the front porch of my mama's house. I don't, I don't sell the dope. I didn't even have one change of clothes. I had to do wash every day, judge. How can I be the seller of dope? And I thought, how could someone that poor, who's begging for change, be so important that we incarcerate him for life? The other thing that was in there was the pr probation officer's uh, pre-sentence investigation report. And very often, you'll see, you know, a prisoner will write to you and say, you know, here's what happened. And then you'll read the, the PSR, and it'll be a totally different story. But not with Ronald. PSR said exactly that that he was a crack addict, that his <clears throat> he was so addicted, the only place he could live was on the porch of his mom's house because they wouldn't let him in the house, that he only had one change of clothes. And what he was accused of was not selling crack, but telling people where to go buy crack from his brother. And he'd been caught twice before doing this, and because this was his third strike, he got life. Now, we took that case. Let me tell you what students are capable of. Um, there were two of the students in the class, Nicole Swisher and Allison Cattermas. Were they in your class, David? Yeah, when David was there. And they worked hard to tell Ronald's story. Um, now, Ronald started calling me. He called me every Friday. Didn't matter where I was, Ronald would call. I'd be you know, <laughs> driving the kids to school, and, and it would come through the speakers of the car. It's almost like we all got to know him. Uh, last month, it worked. I got to call Ronald Blunt up in the penitentiary and say, the President of the United States has granted you clemency. And he's on his way back home now. He's in a halfway house. That's it. And that's not what I did. That's what students are capable of. That's partly what comes from the kind of engagement that sometimes we ask for at a place like St. Thomas. Um, you know, Susan started this by saying that they, they stole me from Baylor. Hardly. 
And it was more like running here once I found out some of the things that go on here. And it wasn't a mistake. So um, I'll take questions. Anyone have any questions? OK, yeah. question would be good if you would speak it into the mic. Can you, can you talk a bit about, I guess, the trial process and maybe some of the arguments that were pretty consistent from trial to trial? I'm just interested as to sure. what that looked yeah. like. Yeah, I mean, as you might imagine, the defense arguments were usually, uh, we should grant him mercy and, and uh, you know, he's really not that dangerous. My job was, was, was pretty hard because I had to go in front. I mean, jury selection was my hard problem because the jury was full of his followers. So they were already a little inclined to, to be sympathetic to him. And I usually lost. Um, but my arguments, I, I usually, it depended on what the defense was. But at the core of it were a few things. And, and you know, this is what made it so hard for me. Um, one was a challenge to the family. I, I mean, the core, the most important witness that we had was Peter, because Peter was always there. And uh, we had various people at, serve the role of Peter. Uh, there's a, a, one of the law students, Phil Steger, was, was incredible. He showed up as Peter the first time. And he's my witness, because I'm the prosecutor, and I called him. And he's wearing jeans and a hoodie. And I said, you know, Phil, you're, you know, we're doing the trial. You got it. You're a witness. I'm, I'm in charge of you looking presentable. And he said, I'm a fisherman. These are all the clothes I have. And I thought, great, we've got a method actor. But, uh, but he was he was amazing. But but some of the things I bring out of him is Jesus saying, uh, "Who are my brother and my sisters and my mother? You are," and leaves his family waiting outside who says that he's come to separate a mother from the daughter, the, the sister from the brother, the father from the son. That's really challenging. What does that mean? So part of my argument was that he, he challenges a central structure of our society. And then there was this, and this is one of the things that, you know, I used to eavesdrop on the juries as they were talking that was uh, kind of compelling. It, it was this, that, that one of the things that Jesus did <coughs> was that he scorned the people that were educated, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, the scribes. You know, almost always he's pushing them away. And the people that he drew close were people like Peter. They weren't able to read. So how is a heritage of a society going to continue if the people who are chosen to lead, to be at the center, uh, are unable even to read? Um, and then there was this, and this was something that was deeply challenging to me. I, I mean, one thing that, that happened in the course of doing this is that, you know, as a prosecutor, when I was a prosecutor, I'd stay up late at night getting ready for a trial. I'd have the evidence, and I'd go over it again and again and again so that I wouldn't have to, you know, rifle through things to find it. I'd put tabs on everything and be ready to go. But when I was doing the trial, the Gospels were my evidence. And probably for the first time in my life, I had to read them all and memorize them and be able to turn to it on the fly. And once I did that, I found some pretty challenging things. <laughs> and one of them was this, that I had always seen the message of Christ as being one of pacifism. But now I'm in the position of arguing to a jury, to you know, a bunch of people like you all, uh, Christ is dangerous. So how am I going to get there? And kind of to my own internal conflict, I found something, which is that at the Last Supper, two of the uh, apostles pull out swords. And Jesus says, it is enough. He doesn't say, put those away, or this isn't the time. He says, it is enough. And he, before they do that, he's preceded that by saying, you remember when I sent you out without uh, <coughs> you know, a second cloak or... Uh, you know, when he sent out the 70. He said, you know, now there is a time uh, to have a sword. And then they show that they've got it. And then that night, the slave, Malchus, gets his ear cut off. Um, and, you know, remember, you know, Jesus heals it. But he could have prevented the violence in the first place. He knew that 
the followers had the swords. He knew of the violence to come. Um, so how does that fit in with my idea of pacifism? But that's the kind of argument that I would make. Uh, and it was, it was a real challenge. It, it, it changed me to, to think about things that way. I always ended exhausted. Who would you say would be actually your chief witness or your most important prosecution witness? Yeah, I mean, good question, because that's the first thing I had to figure out. It was when we started doing it, uh, you know, I, I thought, oh, man. Because as the prosecutor, I've got the burden. I have to bring the evidence that's going to prove it. The defense has the option of not calling any witnesses. And one of the things that was interesting is that the defense counsel never called Jesus. I kept thinking she was going to call Jesus. I mean, come on, it's, it's Jesus. But uh, it was her policy never to call the, def the defendant because I might be able to trip him up. And I was ready <laughs> if she had. Um, but for me, my most important witness, as I was just saying, was Peter. And the reason is, is it was twofold. One is that Peter was there for everything. Um, and the second is that Peter was an enthusiastic follower. He was a true believer in the truest sense. I mean, uh, you know, uh, God and Moses appears before him and he, he offers to go build Succoth huts for them. Um, you know, his enthusiasm's unbounding. And, and when people played Peter true, the way Phil did, um, he was both a remarkable witness to Christ and a great witness for me because, you know, he didn't deny anything, I, I'd say. And he told, um, you know, he told, while the children were still there, after he'd gathered the children to him, he talked about how if your eye offends you, you should gouge it out. He said that right in front of the kids. And, and Peter would say, he did. People were stupefied. They didn't know why he said that. You know, the, but the master said that. And so he was really the most important witness. Um, you know, the other, because we switch witnesses fairly frequently, um, there was a lot of other people who, who coursed through. One was the rich young ruler. And sometimes I'd call the rich young ruler because that went to another one of my closing arguments, um, which was that this would undercut the economy uh, of our society. If everybody gives away what they have, then what kind of economy do you have? Uh, and I also would talk about the gathering pigs. If you remember, there's an evil spirit. Uh, he casts it into the pigs, and they, they throw themselves over a cliff. Well, that was the livelihood of that village. And so sometimes I'd call a witness to that, although Peter could talk about that as well. And the defense witnesses cycled around a lot, too. But by far, we spent the most time with Peter. And early on, we, figured, we found out that was a, a pretty efficient way to get to things, and one that, that was biblically accurate. Did you find that um, the trial of Jesus was often persuasive in con convincing people to change their opinions on the death penalty? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's something where it happened, but it didn't happen an awful lot, that people would come up and say, you've changed my mind. Um, but what we did see time after time after time is that uh, the people were troubled you know, what I was talking about at the start. That if, uh, and I always did this, I'd watch the people leaving. And of course, I always ended up troubled too because I'm making this argument against Jesus. But the people walking out, they weren't, they weren't happy. And they almost had a, a shroud of darkness over them. Um, and I think that they had been challenged in a way. Now, the, the one time really that we got feedback was we did it at a big church in Oklahoma City. There's over a thousand people that time. And the minister of that church wrote to me later and said that he, several of the people in that, in that congregation had changed their mind and that the discussion had continued for a long time thereafter. Um, so, you know, I can't quantify it, but I do think that it, it probably 
did make a difference. Now, one thing, too, that, that matters in, in the way our society works is that the media is always a magnifier on these things. And we got some good media. Um, when we first were doing it, CNN did a big story on it. Uh, Prez Hilton did a piece on it in the uh, celebrity blog. Um, and so, you know, the, uh, it, when we did it in Oklahoma City, there were 1,000 people there, but there were 40,000 people watching on television. So there was a, a magnifier there, too. So hopefully it did some, some good. But at the very least, even if no one changed their mind about the death penalty, I know that there were a lot of people that at the very least, perhaps for the first time, thought about it actively in the context of their faith. And that's probably a good thing. Did the two students use Christian ideals in their arguments to remove the man's life sentence? No, not explicitly. Uh, I, I would, I don't think so. Although I will say this: that that almost always, even if we're not conscious of it, if those ideals are in us, they come out. And um, I remember going over the petition for Ronald, and you know, there, there was a point where I had to update it and redo it. And I realized that what the students had done, and particularly one of the students, Nicole Swisher, was she had used the word redemption. And she used it in a way that we would within our faith. Now, does that mean something in the secular world? Of course it does. But there's something very elegant about that. That, you know, you, it's like the Christ followers drawing half the fish in the sand. That there's this message of what ideals this comports with. And so I guess the better and, truer and shorter answer to your question is yes, they did. Can I interject with a question, Mark? You yeah. spent obviously a long time doing the trial and then a long time working on the book. And maybe just talk a little bit about how, what effect that, that second part as well as the first had on your own relationship with Christ. Uh, in terms of writing the book, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, one of the things that I needed the period of writing the book to recover from the period of doing the trial. <laughs> that, that uh, you know, the, the prosecutor in me had turned against the Christian in me to some degree. And in writing the book, uh, there were a couple things that came out. And one was the deep tragedy in the lives of all the people that were there. I mean, in the course of this, of course, Jean's tragedy was clear. Sarah's mother had died a couple years before and she was still grieving. Uh, Joy had lost her family because they had rejected her because she's gay. And in the course of doing this, uh, our beloved eight-year-old nephew, Stephen, died in Lake Michigan of exposure while canoeing with my brother. And as I wrote the book, something became clear. And if you read the book, you'll see this. It's that that even, even in the brightest faces and what seems to be the happiest lives, there are those, those deep tragedies. And they are ordered and made sense of by some of the things that we were playing out in the trial. I'm curious, uh, thank you for all of this. I'm really curious and, and um, really intending to read the book, so um, just put that out there. Um, could you say what the charge is against Jesus in your trial? Oh, yeah. And then also if New Testament scholarship is informing how you approach this in, in this exercise. Um, I'm sorry, what was the first question? Oh, the charge. The charge was blasphemy. So, and that was one of the things that was really tricky. That's why we skipped over the first part, the guilty or not guilty, was because we didn't want people getting totally hung up on, is blasphemy a capital crime? And so we had to have them accept that. And then what we did in each state that we went to, we relied on the state law 
to control what the questions were in the second part of the trial. And frankly, they applied to blasphemy pretty, pretty directly. For example, in Texas, the key question is, does the defendant pose uh, the likelihood of future dangerousness? And I was able to argue, yeah, based on all the things that, that I've just discussed, yeah. He poses the risk of, of future dangerousness. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of the, the New Testament scholarship, um, you know, I'm not a theologian. I don't have training in that. I was lucky that, that when we did the trial in California, David Best, who's here, who worked with us there, he has theological training. <laughs> uh, you know, you got an MDiv, that counts as something. But, you know, we, and of course, every place that we did it, uh, we heard from theologians about, about various things that were included. For example, you know, the, the, the uh, challenges to the authenticity of John 8 in and of itself, um, where Susan was playing the, the woman in the dust. Uh, and so we did encounter that. I mean, you don't go out to Fuller Seminary and do it in front of a room full of seminarians and their professors without, without engaging with that. But there was a level at which we had to accept at some kind of facial value the text itself. And, and one of our rules was that we could use the Gospels for impeachment or to refresh recollection. And so there was, um, you know, there's definitely the risk of um, kind of a facile harmonization. And I'm aware of that. But I don't think we, that we, we got stuck in the muck too often on those things. Thank you very much for your talk and sure. uh, very much for the insights. One of the things that struck me about what you were just saying was the exhaustion that you talked about in terms of even just the acting uh, being one rule and of course there was a faith of another rule. And what, re what it caused me to think about was the, the dilemma and the challenge of particularly lawyers, but this is true for business, true for any profession, of what we might call the divided life. Yeah. Uh, between um, a certain claim of faith that holds a certain kind of sense of mercy and justice and pacifism, all these other types of things, and yet finding yourself within this system that is uh, pressuring you to move in a particular direction. Now, you, are, you certainly seem to reconcile it, but I'm wondering, did, did any of that come up with maybe prosecutors that you might have known in death penalty cases, or I was even thinking about mandatory uh, sentencing guidelines, which has been a huge problem for a lot of judges uh, about things that they would know that they ought not to do, but they have to do, and how people deal with that division. Yeah. So, I, so when you, you said exhaustion, but I was also thinking that there's this kind of real division in this, in this kind of person that wants integrity. And so yes. I'm wondering whether that issue of the divided life uh, came up in other, other types of um, uh, venues. All the time. And I mean, in part of, I, I, just one thing, you said acting, and for me it wasn't acting. I was actually making the argument against Christ. I meant it. That, and, and if we're gonna be honest, Christ does pose the threat to the status quo, to the way things are. And there are two things that had always baffled me in the Gospels that became true or, or, or gained meaning for me, became real uh, in troubling ways. And one I've already talked about, that I was a pacifist. But then I had to deal with the fact that there was violence in the Gospels. There was violence that Christ seemed to accept. And I had to change my view. And that's exhausting. Um, and the other thing is, the, it's surprising how many of the things we talked about in the trial lived themselves out. For example, the thing about families being divided against one another by Christ. I never knew what to make of that. That didn't seem right. But during the course of doing this trial, Jean Bishop changes her mind, uh, it decides to forgive, actively forgive the person who killed her sister, and to work against the sentence he received, which is life without parole as a juvenile. She did this as an act of faith. Her family bitterly disagreed with her. And it caused a schism within that family, um, and so these things these things really lived out in the course of doing it. Now, in terms of the two spheres with lawyers, absolutely, um, it's it's very difficult. One of the things about being a prosecutor, for example, is that 
if I'm going to be a prosecutor and I'm going to do it the right way, I have to constantly be engaged with the humanity of the people that are in front of me. One of the things about that job, about being a prosecutor, that people forget is that you are standing as far away as I am from, from George here, and you're saying this person should be locked up. They should lose their freedom. They should not see their kid graduate from high school. They should never be let out of prison. Or some of my students at Baylor now make the argument, this person should die. Think about what that means. To stand next to someone and say, they should die at the hand of the state. And now I want you, 12 people, to vote to have him killed. If you engage with everything that goes with that, with the humanity of it, the, the, the human integrity of that person, it's exhausting. And people find ways not to, you know? They assume omniscience, they assume perfection of the system, that if the person was indicted, well, they must be guilty. Um, you know, and I, I did the same thing. I found myself falling into those, those tricks to avoid engaging, not just with the defendants, but with the victims of crime sometimes. Because criminal law is all tragedy. I thought when I became a prosecutor, be the, there'd be this moment where it'd be like Rocky and you're running up the steps and you're like, yes! And it never came. I'd win a trial and I'd be sitting there and the jury would come back and say guilty and I felt like crap. Because you never unmurder somebody. You don't unrape a woman. The best you can do is prevent that harm from happening from the same person in the future for some period of time. Um, and given that that whole thing is imbued, soaked in blood and tragedy, if, and that's if you do it right. If you do it wrong, you stop seeing those things and then we get to injustice. And so it's a huge problem in that field. Thanks for talking, Mark. Uh, just kind of a follow-up on that question, just about the impact of the, of the, I guess, writing the book and doing the process. Um, I'm just wondering, where are you at now in terms of some of those hard teachings of Jesus? You can't help but notice we're standing here in, uh, at St. Thomas and as a, a pillar of the community. And, you know, you can make a very somewhat simplistic observation. Jesus was opposed to the religious pillars in his communities. In the South, it's Protestant religious pillars. Mm -hmm. Some might say, you know, yeah, maybe you're kind of twisting some of those passages. You just, you just strung some, all the worst Jesus passages together about gouging out eyes and, eh, you know, that, that's not the real heart of, the, of, of Jesus' message. Or maybe it is. And so how are you kind of processing some of those hard teachings or the, some of those longer-term conclusions? Well, that teaches us something very true about criminal law, doesn't it? I mean, think about the fact that that, that, that accusation can fairly be made, right? is that I'm patching together the worst things into uh, uh, you know, a quilt of guilt. Um, what do prosecutors do? You take this one moment in the person's life and then you crank up the, 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 uh, you know, the pathos as much as you can. I mean, if that's what we were doing in the trial, in front of a congregation that knows the Gospels, think how easy it is for a prosecutor who has all the power to do that. I mean, one of the things that was surprising, shocking to me is when I, I'd worked for a big firm in Detroit for three years, and then I became a prosecutor. When I worked for the big firm, if we wanted to find something out from the other side, we had to do depositions and interrogatories and document requests, and you know all this stuff. But, um, and then I became a prosecutor. You know, if we want to know something, we get a warrant, the FBI goes, they break down your door, they take your whole file cabinet and bring it to me. And now I've got it. It was a lot easier. And then I can go through there and patch together the stuff that makes you look really, really bad. And then I can go in front of a grand jury and there's no defense attorney there at all. And I can, I can put that up there and get an indictment and now you're looking at a long term and I can get you to plead. So if, if that is what I was doing, and at times it was, that brings to the surface a very deep and hard truth about criminal law.
yeah, I mean, for certainly it had that effect on me. <laughs> I mean, I would kept discovering passages because I'd be looking for the bad parts and I'd find them and be like, oh no, you know, because I, I didn't want to see Jesus that way and have to work through it. Um, so yeah, that was part of it too. <laughs> George? Uh, I too am not a theologian, so this may be a very bad question. I see the head of our theology friend who's waiting back there. He would like nothing more than to expose my <laughs> ignorance in this area. He's taking notes, he says. Uh, the question is this, though. Did you ever, at the end of the trial, have people come up to you and say, well, yes, you convinced me that from a human perspective, Jesus' condemnation was a violation, but that from a Christian perspective, his death was essential for resurrection, salvation, redemption, and so it's, it's wrong to judge it by these human qualities? Yes, yes, there were people that said that. And, and, and you know, sometimes it was theologians. We, you know, you do it at Fuller Seminary or someplace like that, and you're going to get a lot of theologians. We did it, at, at, you know, when it was at Seventh and James Church in Waco. That's a church that's full of, of biblical scholars, and, and that argument was, was certainly made. And in fact, even Perez Hilton said that because he was reporting on a trial we did during, during Lent, and he said, uh, he noted that the, that that church had acquitted, or not acquitted, but found not to execute Jesus. And he said, way to ruin your own holiday, Christians. <laughs> so <laughs> it wasn't just the theologians who wondered about that. Dave? Most criminal cases don't go to trial these days. Yeah. They're plea bargain. Did you ever offer Jesus a plea bargain? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Um, I never did offer Jesus a, a plea bargain. I can imagine, you know, uh, having a thousand people show up and telling him, uh, you can all go home because we worked it out and he's doing life, um, which, which is what happens in courtrooms all the time. You know, they'll have a trial and they'll call 80 people in and then they'll send them all home. But no, we didn't do that. So uh, that, would be, that would be a little too realistic, I suspect. Other questions? Uh, thank you for coming and speaking. I appreciate it. Um, so C.S. Lewis talks about how currently in the system there's basically three uh, reasons for punishment. Uh, protect people from this person doing stuff again to strike fear into people from doing the same act and for rehabilitation. And he says all of these eventually in the end lead to injustice against this person who's committed some uh, offense. He says the only really good reason for punishment is retribution. Um, and in light of that, and in light of your discovery in the gospel that Jesus is not the ultimate pacifist at times, um, and that there's very much parts of it where he doesn't seem like a pacifist, and especially when reading Revelation, you see, okay, Jesus isn't always a pacifist. Um, is, are you, I'm not necessarily arguing against you, I just want to hear your thoughts on this, but is there nothing so heinous that can uh, merit uh, capital punishment in that sense as a re retribution to someone? Um, I, this is one of those things where I can apply reason and say that there is a purpose for retribution. It sets boundaries, you know? Uh, and that's one purpose for retribution. It prevents vigilanteism, say. That argument's been made. And I understand that. It's just inconsistent with my faith. Even after doing the trial all these times, there's, there's three things that come back to me. And one is Jesus saying, when you visit those in prison, you visit me. And that means if we're seeking retribution, we're seeking against the least of these. The second thing is John 8. And I understand the authenticity issues. But it does seem consistent with a lot of other things that happened. And when you read John 8, and I, believe me, at Baylor, people love to argue with me about this, and quoted C.S. Lewis about this, um, is they'll read that and they'll say, you know, but Jesus said, go and sin no more. That's our ability to judge her. But why, when we read that story, do we always make ourselves Jesus? You know, we read these gospel stories, and then we're like, and so, since I'm Jesus, here's what I take from that. We're not Jesus. We're the person Jesus is teaching. 
I'm the person with the stone. I'm the woman in the dust. I'm the Pharisees. But I'm not Jesus. And then the third thing is this. Is that I don't think what happened to Christ is untrue. I think what's reported in the Gospels is the shape of a life actually lived. Of, of, of the Son of God on earth. And I don't think the things that happened to him were accidental. I don't think it was someone just blundering from one thing to the next. I think God created and crafted that life to teach us something. There's a reason that, that Jesus was born into poverty, that we're supposed to take something from that manger, from that rough poverty that he was born into. And I think it means something, deeply means something, that so much of what we learn in the Gospels is about criminal law, is about the trial that Christ faced, that he was a capital defendant, that he was executed. Um, you know, <clears throat> Muhammad wasn't executed. The Buddha died of natural causes. It's, it's only Christ that we, we have a faith. That the center of it is an unjust execution. It's hard to look at that really and say, well, what we need to be doing is calibrating our retribu retributive instincts. It seems like the greater message out of that is we need to learn so often the message of this faith is to deny yourself your impulses. And that's, and retribution is an impulse. You know, I've got this thing that I do that's retributivist that's really stupid. And that is, if, if, you know, if I'm walking along and someone pulls their car right up next to me, I kick the car. Now, I'm going to get shot probably, you know, if I go back to Texas and do that. But, you know, I'm not hurting the car. I'm just making the driver mad. I'm just mad. I'm lashing out at that car. But... It's not right. And as with so many other things, the role of faith is a difficult one. It's one of limitations. And that includes, I think, retribution. Other questions? I'd like to go back to the jurors and, and maybe discussions that you had with them afterwards. Now, they, they only have one case before them, yeah. and they can, as a prosecutor and defense a lawyer do, they can play their roles in the system. Mm -hmm. They can apply the standards uh, to the facts that, you know, that they've just had argued before them. But they're choosing, to de they're, they're deciding whether someone's going to live or die. And that always... Um, feels to me like you're playing God. And did they ever think about or express that aspect of it if they'd had a second case and the facts were just a little bit different? Is that, is that difference sufficient so that one sh person should live and the other should die? Yeah. And there's a morality involved here, or, or a Christian principle maybe, but a morality involved here that um, is, is you don't find expressed in the law it, that would guide that very, yeah. what might be a very minuscule distinction. Yeah, and you know, in terms of, of doing this trial, people were cognizant of the fact that we weren't going to go execute the guy playing okay. Jesus. But, but where I really learned about this, and this is something that, that I think about all the time, is that, that when I initially did the trial in Texas, in that church, there were several people who'd been on death penalty juries. They'd been at that point, uh, you know, had, had had that experience of deciding whether someone was going to live or die. In Waco, it's pretty common. And uh, those people in that congregation all approached me to talk about that experience, exactly that experience. And it's, it's remarkable. I mean, one of the things that's wrong about the death penalty is we pay people $40 a day to have an experience of determining whether or not someone dies. 
That's ridiculous. Um, and they're traumatized by it. And these were people that believed in the death penalty or else they wouldn't have been on the, the jury in the first place. Um, and they were, and they were people of faith, they were members of this congregation, people I knew otherwise. Um, and, and they were deeply, deeply troubled. And they saw that person that they had condemned. Um, so, yeah, that is, <laughs> that is something where it's not just the morality of the individual, but group dynamics are so important in juries. And who, who we follow and who we lead. Um, but, you know, they have to come to a conclusion. And where they have found for death, those people live with that the rest of their lives is having decided to kill someone and nothing less. Okay, if there are no further questions, then join me in thanking our speaker, Mark Osler.